Let me ask you a dumb question. Have you ever been afraid? Uh, of course, right? I mean, um, so when was the last time you were afraid? Anybody? Anybody want to offer that up? Do what? Last year, yeah. Karen's been through a lot. Anybody else? Anybody afraid this morning from about anything? Anybody afraid of being late? <laughs> oh, you have a few? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, fear is a pretty universal thing. Um, maybe you're a tough person. Maybe it takes a lot for you to, to be afraid. Um, what if I started walking around the room and I would, I would stop in front of you and say, God told me a little something about you. Would you be afraid then? <laughs> but maybe it doesn't take much at all. Psychologists, they, they love to study fear. Movie makers and writers, they like to explore uh, its depths. They like to play on it. Insurance companies, investment bankers, and pharmaceutical companies, among a lot of others, like to make money off of your fear. Government takes your freedoms, buys your votes with the currency of fear. Fear is an interesting thing. It's part nature. Um, so, so fear of heights and fear of loud noises are pretty universally understood to be a DNA wiring, um, a part of nature uh, for us in that. I noticed that uh, as I got taller as a young man, little kids got more and more scared of me, and I couldn't figure out why because I was the most docile, gentle fellow there was. Well, turns out they were afraid because I was way up here, and they were way down there. So I learned, especially when talking with little kids, the best thing I could do is get down on one knee, right? Um, so that's kind of hardwired in. Um, and then there's nurture, uh, how and why and, and where you're exposed to certain situations or objects or ideas. That plays into to the bigger part of, of each of our own fear factors. Other things, um, like snakes or needles, uh, they, they can bring about a fear response. In fact, I think those might be hardwired too at least in me. Um, so, so when we talk about fear, um, the things that, that scare us the most uh, oftentimes are things like being lonely or being unable to support our families or being sick or being unpopular or being inadequate to just about any, any task or calling. Fear can be pretty crippling. We, we can just stop trying in so many different ways to move forward in life when we're afraid. Now, the Bible says lots of times, fear not. How many of you have heard or repeated this idea that the Bible says fear not 365 times and, and 366 for those pesky leap years? You ever heard that or repeated that? You ever actually done your own study to see if that's true? I started looking into this. It, it kind of looks to not be true. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we have built-in fear days. Like, oh, there's not enough, so today I get to be afraid. The, the number is actually closer to like 142, 145, depending, depends on who you ask and, and how you translate a couple of phrases. Um, now, if you count several variants of the, of the words themselves, but you still keep with the intent of the phrase, fear not, you might get up to closer to 200. But, and it's a big but, wouldn't, wouldn't once be enough, seeing as how it's God doing the talking in His Word? I mean, shouldn't once be enough? He says, fear not. Okay, that's our marching orders. Let's balance that out just a little bit. We in the church have done some weird things in pursuit of the fear not ideal. One of those weird things, for example, is repeating an antidote about fear not without actually doing our research to see if it's in there like that. And sometimes by, by this whole fear not um, pounding, we sometimes drive people to inertia. They, they know that their fear is real, but then because the Bible says over and over, fear not, they feel like a failure. They feel sinful or, or, or any host of things. Now on the sinful thing, can I, can I qualify that by saying, well, I mean, maybe, maybe. I mean, maybe my fear, or more importantly, and maybe even more accurately, my reaction to fear, I mean, maybe that's sinful. 
We'll dive into that a little bit more. But, but I think it's the reaction to our fears that really gets us into trouble. But fear itself, how many of you would agree that's pretty normal? Yeah, a few of you. That's good. Ah! Um, all right. I wanted to do that since I started. Uh, so in the Old Testament, we, we have several instances of God's chosen person or people in any given situation, and they're going up against a bigger, stronger opponent, and God tells them, fear not. What we don't see over and over and over is we don't see God going, I'm going to give you a bigger sword. I'm going to let you invent the cannon before the other guy. What's he do? He says, fear not. Oftentimes, that's that's followed up with, I will go in front of you, or I've got this in hand. But you're still going to need to walk through this. Over the centuries, people have faced some pretty crazy things to be afraid of. Just for saying they follow Jesus. People have been beaten, eaten, burned, boiled, baked, broken, disowned, displaced, decapitated, shot, sliced, crucified. All kinds of things. Tortured in every way imaginable just because they say they follow Jesus. There's an organization called Voice of the Martyrs that exists to promote the cause of the persecuted church all over the world today. Because all that stuff still happens. All kinds of various forms that still happens to people who say they follow Jesus all over the world today. It was originally started, the Voice of the Martyrs, by, uh, it, was, it was called Jesus to the Communist World by Richard Wormbron and his wife Sabina, who both suffered in Romania for preaching the gospel. Both of them were imprisoned and Richard was beaten. He was, he was stored underground without light or windows or sound. In fact, they even had the guards put felt on the bottom of their boots so he couldn't hear anything. Because they were wanted to, I mean, it's sadistic. They were experimenting on this guy as they're holding him in custody, right? Um, they stored him in an ice box for a while. Just enough air to, to keep him alive. He spoke about having the flesh beaten off the bottoms of his feet. And then they would come back in and, and they'd beat the the bare bottoms of his feet. Now, all he had to do was just be quiet. All he had to do was say, I don't believe in Jesus. That's all he had to do. Jesus to the communist world. And incidentally, if you're ever tempted to think that embracing communism or some form thereof would be a good idea for our country, you might want to go and talk or read some writings of Christians who have been through that kind of change. Because there's a concerted effort in that kind of movement to remove God from the public square. Anyway, do you think Richard was ever afraid? Think he was ever afraid? We've been looking at the Apostle Paul, uh, his second missionary journey. And he's traveled through a few cities in the book of Acts. Uh, Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens. And I've dumped, I know, I've dumped a lot of information on you. A ton of information. I know that. There's a lot in there, and there, there's still a lot as Paul keeps traveling. But today, uh, I want to share with you a couple of verses that really just kind of stop me in my tracks. So you can probably guess what that singular uh, subject of today is going to be. Anybody want to hazard a guess? Fear? Yeah. Okay, so let's do a recap real quick. Paul has already been beaten. He's been put in prison. He's been worshipped as a Greek god. Uh, he got dragged out of the city and beaten and left for dead. He's already been through quite a bit. And then he goes to this city called Thessalonica where Paul's friends, uh, they get dragged into the middle of the city because the Jewish mob can't find Paul. And, and it's the Jewish mob and their new friends, the wicked men of the city of Thessalonica. And they search a guy named Jason. They search his house for Paul. They can't find him. They take uh, Jason into custody. Um, and they require them to post bond, basically, pay him off to let him loose. So then Paul gets whisked away by night to a place called Berea. And here, the folks there, they continually search the scriptures, and many of them come to Jesus. Like they're, they're like, okay, what did God tell us about in the Old Testament here? Does that line up with what Paul is telling us about this Jesus fella? And they found it to be true. So they, they come to faith. But then those angry guys from back in Thessalonica, they're still angry. So they hear about what's going on in Berea, and they go there and they stir up all these crowds against Paul and the guys that are traveling with him. So Paul's friends and supporters send him to Athens. 
which is what we looked at the last couple of weeks. And he reasons with folks there about Jesus. So the Athenian smart guys, they, they give Paul an audience in this place called the Areopagus. It was a real, it was like your uh, Facebook uh, in the first century. It was a place of influence. Um, Facebook, YouTube, X, I don't know. I'm, I, I can't keep up. Um, but he goes there and he speaks, and, and, and some of them listen to him, but mostly they, they think he's pretty wacky with all this stuff. So we're going to be in Acts 18, actually the end of 17. We'll finish up here. Uh, verse 32, it's pages 1,722 and 23 in your pew Bibles there in front of you if you want to follow along. Acts 17, 32, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst. Okay, let me, uh, just for a second, just for my own um, edification and enjoyment, uh, give me your best sneer. I want to see a sneer. Come on, sneer. All right. Okay. All right. Pretty good. I, I think you could do better, but you're being polite. Uh, so basically, they dismissed Paul. Um, verse 34, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite, uh, Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Uh, the Areopagite guy, if you uh, want to do some more research on him, uh, look him up. There's, there's some church tradition about what he went on to be, but most likely the first elder of the church there in Athens. Um, so that was a really important audience um, there that Paul had. Okay, that's where we pick it up in chapter 18. Verse 1, After these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Okay, so Paul goes to Corinth. Corinth is about um, 60 miles or so from Athens. It's a big town for Paul. Uh, possibly at that point in history, about 200,000 people. Uh, very metropolitan, lots of languages spoken there. Um, it's a commerce center because of its position uh, on the little strip of land between the Aegean Sea and the Ionian Sea. And if, if you're, let's see if I'm trying to do my geography. Basically, if you could get across that little strip of land, at the narrowest point, it was three or four miles, it gave you a straight line between Asia and Rome. Okay, so that's what made Corinth so important um, as a spot. Anyway, um, this guy named Plato, anybody ever heard of Plato? Plato, not Plato. Plato, the smart guy. Okay. Plato talked, uh, Plato talked of Corinthian girls. You can probably figure out what that means. It sounds like something that, that Tom Petty might have written a song about if he'd been around in the first century. Those Corinthian girls. Um, probably some young men wished they could all be Corinthian girls. Um, and to Corinthianize meant to corrupt the morals of somebody. There, there's a ton about uh, Corinth, but hopefully you can start to see some, some parallels to, to our present day, like, like a, a focus on commerce, very metropolitan. Uh, morals are, are uh, they're not questionable. The question's been answered. They're, they're bad. Anybody know of any places like that? Okay, so, so modern day parallels are there. Um, now, if you want to know some of the stuff that they struggled with in Corinth, within the church, this is something we sometimes forget. If you read uh, First and Second Corinthians, it's a little there to the right in your Bible, um, you'll see some of the stuff they struggled with in the church, okay? And, and it might make you blush. If it doesn't make you blush, we should talk. Um, so Paul had to deal with this reality. You, you could put the Christ into the Corinthian, but it took a fair bit of work to get the Corinthian out of the Christian. So Paul finds work there in Corinth as a tent maker, and he did what he always does. He goes to the synagogue every Sabbath to reason with the Jews and Greeks about Jesus with the express desire to persuade them of the truth of the gospel. Verse 5, but when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. And when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on I shall go to the Gentiles. Pretty typical for Paul, right? He goes to the synagogue. He reasons with them. Um, 
It doesn't go so well there. And they, they resist the gospel, they malign and disbelieve about Jesus, and Paul does this thing with his clothes. He shakes out his clothes. And here's the significance of that. When a Jewish person would leave an unclean place, he would shake out his garments so the uncleanness didn't follow him. So that'd be like if you were Jewish and you went to a Gentile city, um, you'd shake the dust off of that city before you would re-enter a clean place. But see, Paul's doing just the opposite of that. He's basically calling all those Jews who are rejecting Jesus, he's, tell, he's basically saying, you are hopelessly unclean. They've been reasoned with. They've attempt, he's attempted to persuade them. He's warned them. So now he says this thing that their blood is on their own heads. Now this blood on their own heads thing, that's not just Paul getting mad in the moment. It's actually a reference to a few spots in the Old Testament, stuff that, that Paul and his Jewish synagogue audience, all those people would have understood this. Way back in the Old Testament, about uh, oh, five, 600 years before this incident with Paul, there's a prophet named Ezekiel, and, and God tells his prophet Ezekiel to tell the people, to warn the people to repent and to turn back to God. Now, Ezekiel, he's told by God that if he fails to warn them, that their blood will be on his head. But if he warns them, then their blood is on their own heads. This part here is, is also pretty interesting. God doesn't really give Ezekiel any, any wiggle room here. It's, it's very both, if, if you're familiar with the New Testament and the piece that we call the Great Commission, uh, th this is very Great Commission-y and, and very appropriate to our Apostle Paul. You're, you'll see what I mean. God talking to Ezekiel, people are in exile by being conquered by a world power, and now in Ezekiel 3, I'm actually going to read out the, the New Living Translation here, uh, 3 verse 5, I am not sending you to a foreign people whose language you cannot understand. No, I'm not sending you to people with strange and difficult speech. If I did, they'd listen. But the people of Israel won't listen to you any more than they listen to me, for the whole lot of them are hard-hearted and stubborn. But look, he's talking to Ezekiel, his own follower, right, his own prophet. He says, but look, I made you as obstinate and hard-hearted as they are. I've made your forehead as hard as the hardest rock. You ever met anybody like that? So don't be afraid of them or fear their angry looks, even though they are rebels. And then the next part seems really crucial to this whole operation that he sent in Ezekiel on. Then he added, Son of man, let all my words sink deep into your own heart first. Listen to them carefully for yourself. Then go to your people in exile and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. And do this whether they listen to you or not. So the Jewish people, they can't say they weren't told. And so we move back into Paul's moment there. He's shaking out his garments. He's saying, your blood is on your own heads. He's just following the pattern of the prophetic voices that have come before him. And it's a brave moment for Paul. But it's kind of what we've come to expect about Paul, right? I mean, this dude, he gets beat, dragged around thrown out of town, everything else, and he just gets up and he keeps taking it. He's brave. Verse 7 in Acts 18, And he departed from there and went to the house of a certain man named uh, Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next to the synagogue. Now, I have to tell you, my eight-year-old brain found this quite comical. So he's over here at the synagogue, and he makes this... And he shakes out his garments and your blood be on your own heads. Shuts the door. Right next door. Anybody else find that funny? Maybe it's just me. I just think it's funny. He makes this grandstand and then he goes right next door. Uh, isn't it amazing how close we can be to the gospel and not get it? And it's right next door. It's right next door. And maybe you're that next door. He doesn't go across town. He doesn't, he doesn't say, you know what, that's it, I'm going to another city. He goes next door. Verse 8, And Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. We're going to talk about this Crispus guy um, defecting from the synagogue. We'll talk about that a little bit more next week. Um, okay, here we go. The part I really want us to wrestle with this morning together. I, I've been wrestling with it all week. 
I'm, I'm actually a bit afraid, as, as our theme is fear, because uh, I'm not sure I'm actually going to do this justice today. You, you, I don't know. Verse 9. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision. I, th- this, this passage, i got to tell you, this passage wrecked me when I read this. Okay. The Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. Now, before I go on, I have to say, I've never really sat with these verses before. They just seem like this transitory part, going on to the next part, you know, this between Paul and Jesus and and whatever. And and maybe that's why it struck me so hard when I hit it this time. The Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. Doesn't that seem a little bit different to y'all from, from even just if, if this is the first time you've heard about the Apostle Paul, but I told you what all he's been through. Don't that seem a little bit off? Fear. In the Apostle Paul? And it must have been the kind of fear that might have shut him up. Because Jesus tells him to go on speaking and don't be silent. Don't be afraid anymore, super apostle hero man of the hour, Paul. This part is so exacting and it doesn't give us much wiggle room. I mean, what's Paul afraid of? Could be he's afraid of getting beaten, beaten again. Or putting his friends in danger. Or going to jail or being ostracized and ran out of town. Maybe he's afraid of the government at that point. Maybe he's afraid someone will bring up his past. Maybe he's afraid the people won't listen. Whatever it is, from the encouragement that Jesus gives Paul in this vision, we see that this fear is enough to maybe even get him to be quiet. The Apostle Paul, afraid to speak. What are you afraid of? What might keep you silent? If Jesus appeared to you in a vision and he said, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, would you know in that moment exactly what he's talking about in that first phrase of the sentence, don't be afraid any longer? If Jesus said that to you, would you be like, I know what he's talking about. Anybody else in here kind of know what he's talking about? Now here's the deal. Whatever it is that you and me are afraid of, here's the, here's the trouble with fear. Here's what I do, okay? I'm not putting any of this on you. Maybe I'm the weird guy in the room. We've probably already established that. But, but here we go, right? Here's the deal. Whatever it is, the excuses come out rapid fire about why we don't do the second part. Go on speaking and do not be silent. I'm not smart enough. I don't have enough influence. I know. I'll just be real good, and then my actions will speak louder than my words. Well, the Spirit, the Spirit hasn't really moved me yet. They won't listen anyway. Now, if you want, schedule a time, and we can debate those if those are your excuses. Because I think we can actually work through those. Now, we get real spiritual about it, too, right? We could say, well, evangelism just isn't my spiritual gift. I just don't have the gift of disciple-making. You know what? I'd have to agree with you on those last two. Nobody has those gifts. Now, you might argue that evangelism as a gift is implied in Romans 12 or even stated in Ephesians 4. If you're doing that much research to get out of it, man, you've got a problem. But the Ephesians 4 passage, where it actually talks about God giving people to be an evangelist, that's actually more of an office in the church. Now, granted, some folks are are better at those things than other folks, but that's usually, really listen to what I'm going to say here. Some people are better at this than other folks, but that's usually by virtue of purpose, presence, and practice, and not by virtue of proclivity. But... The fear is real, right? I mean, we can't say the fear is not real. It is. 
How freeing, though, is it to see that the guy we so often put on a pedestal as the paragon of Clint Eastwood-style toughness was afraid, just like us. We get afraid for any number of reasons. When Paul writes a letter to this Corinthian church a few years later, he writes in 1 Corinthians 2.3, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. All of those words, weakness, fear, and trembling, these are strong description of Paul's emotional state. He uses three words to convey this. He could have just said, you know, I was kind of afraid. But he doesn't. He uses these three words. It's not what you would consider a super evangelist, right? I mean, this is an ongoing state of fearfulness we see described in Acts 18. Paul confirms it in 1 Corinthians, almost like, hey, I know that you guys could probably see it on me when I got there, but I'll just own up. I came to Corinth and I was afraid. So being afraid, I mean, that can't necessarily be the sin, right? I mean, this is the part that I'm, I'm working through this passage on. This is the part where I don't know if I'll do it justice. I, I think it's what we do with the fear. I'm leaning more towards barking up that tree, and maybe I'm doing that just to salve my own, my own situation. Does Jesus talk about fear? How does he look at all this? Now, this next part, you're going to feel like maybe I'm, I'm smacking you around, and I'm not, I promise, because I've, I've been sitting with this too. But I, I want us to go to Matthew chapter 25, and, and let's just see how God thinks about this stuff. And fear is in this one that I'm going to tell you about. The, the story is about a master who has three servants, and he's going away for a long journey, so he, he wants them to keep the, the, the business going. So he gives the first guy five bags of money, and the second guy gets two bags, and the third guy gets one. And he's not being mean to those guys that, that he gave the two and the, the one to, the, the one that he gave less than the five guys. In fact, he's being real graceful to them because he's giving them what he thinks they can handle. And after a long time, the master comes back, and he calls the servants to settle up. And that first guy that, that he gave five to, well, that guy had invested the five bags and gained five more. And the second guy that had the two bags, he invested those and he got two more. So the master's pretty pleased with those guys and he told them to enter into the joy of their master's rest. I want you to take an extended vacation with me to enjoy everything that I have. So then the master gets to the guy that had been given the one bag of money to. And this one bag of money guy says in, in Matthew 25, verse 24, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid. And I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. Now in the story, can you guess uh, who the master is in the story? Who's the master? God or Jesus, right? Okay. Um, so the one bad guy, he says, I, I know you are powerful. I know that you make bank when nobody else can. I was afraid and I hid your stuff. How do you think Jesus reacts to that? Oh, you poor dear. I, I did not mean to scare you. You, you just do you, okay? It, it's okay that you didn't do anything. I mean, how could you know what might have happened? I mean, it could have just, it could have went bad if you just stepped out there and invested. It could have it easily gone bad for you in the market. I'm so sorry you felt intimidated and scared. You are loved. You are valued. You are enough. I mean, that sounds kind of Jesus-y, doesn't it? Let's see how Jesus actually finishes the story. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. So not even really invest it. Just, just put it somewhere where it's going to do something. You see, Jesus saw through the third guy's fear, and he called it for what it was. 
So you see, the third guy was trying, this was a selfish attempt to enjoy the master's favor without risking true faith in the master himself. And of course, it would breed fear when the master returned. The, the third servant, his reaction of fear is perfectly logical. It makes perfect sense that he'd be afraid. You see, I don't think fear was the real issue. Fear was the catalyst, or maybe even the result. But why would I say I don't think fear is, is actually the real issue here? Here's the thing. The verses after um, seeing the master throwing, what happens after that? The master throws this servant into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. What do you think that's talking about? It's not talking about, well, he got less rewards in heaven. Because I don't think there's a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth in heaven. Okay? And, and the next story that Jesus tells in Matthew 25 is about judgment. And it's like the, the sheep and the goats kind of judgment. So I think the real issue was that this guy, this third guy, he only knew just a little bitty bit about the master. But he didn't really know the master. He only knew one side of the master's character. And he certainly didn't have the master's heart about this. He didn't care like the master. He wasn't trying to keep the business going. He just didn't know the master. And knowing the master is the key to the whole thing. Because when you really know him, then you begin to act like him. You begin to take on his heart. You begin to take on his attributes and his image. When you see this story, how many of you think the master is being unfair or unjust at this point? Trick question. Because there's something inside of us that does think that, right? Because we let our fear get the best of us too, don't we? You see, Paul's fear there in Corinth didn't get the best of him. He acknowledged it, like we read about, but there was something bigger at play here. Let's go back to Acts 18, verse 9. The Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. Verse 10, For I am with you. And no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. You see the key in there? Jesus doesn't chastise Paul for his fear. Jesus says, I've got you covered in ways you can't even see yet. I have people in the city, and they don't even know they're my people yet. And quick sidebar. I get pretty excited. This part is pretty awesome. I have many people in the city. See, when God brought us out here to the Sacramento area, I think God was telling me, I have many people in the city. They don't even know it yet. They don't even know they're mine yet. There in Corinth, they didn't know about Jesus yet. That's why Paul was there. I mean, there had been no church planted there yet. So God is looking way ahead on this thing. He knows there are people that are worshiping Him, worshiping God, and they will be receptive to the message of Christ. Can I tell you this morning that God Almighty has people in this city that don't even know they belong to Him yet? What do you think about that? There might be people in this room right now they don't know Jesus is the Savior yet. And God says, that's all right, they're mine. It's just a matter of time. Some of you, you don't even know that you're on a crash course with the grace of God, that Jesus is going to save you. He's going to get a hold of your heart. And when he does, you won't be able to shut up about it, regardless of what else you might fear. I mean, that's how it's supposed to work, right? I, I, I think that's how it's supposed to work. So what did Paul do after getting that vision from God? Verse 11, and he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. I avoid this because it's part of my, my past. In, in police work, everything was always reduced to like little sayings and things so we could remember stuff. Um, but I did that with this. How, how was Paul able to stay there in this place where he was afraid, teaching the word of God among them for 18 months? Four things. He faced it, he graced it, he laced it, and then he raced it. <laughs> he faced it. And, and Jesus helped him with, with, by calling it out. But Paul acknowledges his fear. And so he even writes about it, reminding the Corinthians later about it when he writes to them. 
What's that require for us to face a shortcoming or a weakness? It takes courage. What else? What character trait? Humility, right? Have you ever noticed in our language we've, we've started changing that word? We call it humbleness. We don't like the word humility. It requires humility to face it. Would you be humble enough to admit your fear? Then Paul, he graced it. One thing Paul writes about over and over is the grace God has shown us in Christ Jesus. Jesus applied grace to Paul in this situation by, by giving him this vision, and Paul received it. So how did I know he received it? Well, Paul didn't stop speaking. Paul didn't go silent. Have you accepted the grace that God has been giving you and patiently working you out of your fear? Or every time he tries to apply grace to you, you're running so fast that none of it sticks. Well, what else did Paul do? He laced it. Paul was laced with God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. Laced with that, Paul moves forward. How do I know? Because he will later write to those Corinthians about coming to them in fear, but also completely in the Word of God and in the power of the Spirit. Remember our, our Ezekiel guy from the Old Testament? Here's something else from Ezekiel 3. God told him before he was supposed to go out and talk to the people about God. Remember this part, verse 10? Let all my words sink deep into your own heart first. Listen to them carefully for yourself. When we realize that we have the very Word of God and we don't use it, well, I mean, that's on us. Is your life laced with His Word and with His Spirit? Last thing, Paul raced it. He's going to later write to Timothy, one of his disciples he made and, and who helped him in his travels in, in uh, is it 2 Timothy 4? 2 Timothy 4. I couldn't remember which Timothy. Second letter he writes to Timothy. Chapter 4, verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And the future there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. That's how Paul stayed ahead of it. Some of you might be thinking, if, if you're familiar with your Bibles, of, of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's, let, let us rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Rich, you guys, band can come on up. You guys have been very gracious to listen to me this long. Hope you're not afraid of missing lunch. <laughs> I want you to be encouraged this morning. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you and me if we belong to Christ. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you and me if we belong to Christ. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you and me if we belong to Christ. Amen? Amen? When you look at the person next to you, do you see that? Do you see that? Look for it. Because here's the thing. We live in a pretty Corinthian place and time. Fear is real. It was real to Paul. It's been real to everybody who's ever walked this planet. But what are we going to do with it? We're going to face it, grace it, lace it, and race it, folks. Why go through all this? Why not just ignore it? Like, I'll, I'll get my salvation figured out and just hang on till I die. You laugh, but how many Christians do that? If you're asking this question, can I gently say you probably don't really know the Master? That as much as you want to bask in His grace, you're losing the race. And I don't want you to beat you up about that, but Matthew 25, that should lift you up. That should give you courage. That should say, you know what? I know that my God is bigger and that my God will, will reap where He doesn't sow and gather where He hasn't scattered. And because of that, I'm going to rely on Him and I'm going to quit being afraid and I'm just going to go. 
I'm not going to wear some big fancy uniform. I'm not going to wear some big fancy collar. I'm not going to wear some big fancy degree. I know what I know, and I'm going to tell people about Jesus. And here's the thing. If Matthew 25 beats us up, then we got some heart work to do. And that's where the grace comes in. Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. Because Jesus says, I am with you. Do you believe that this morning, church? All right, let's go out and act like it, amen? All right, if you would, stand up. Let's pray together. We're going to sing a final song here. If you have a need this morning, if you're afraid, if you need courage, man, let's, let's pray for it. You know, that, that first part, um, face it. I'm afraid. I don't know what to say. I don't know how this works. Whatever it might be, then let's pray through that. There's nothing like having brothers and sisters pray for you. I know I'm going a little bit long here, but I want to share something with you this morning. I'm kind of an introvert at heart, believe it or not. And uh, so when this room fills up, I get a little edgy. And, and I love the room filling up. But this morning I was back here uh, in the hallway kind of gathering my thoughts. And as I'm gathering my thoughts, I get a text from um, another pastor. And he's telling me... Um, Philippians chapter 1, that, that God who has begun a good work in you will complete it till the day of Christ Jesus. And then he says this curious thing, because that's not even really about fear. He says, hey, don't be afraid this morning. <laughs> like, he sees you when you're sleeping. <laughs> I get it. But the mission is bigger than any one of us. And there is a world out there that doesn't know Jesus. And they need to. And if you don't know Jesus this morning, but you're on that collision course, then let's have that conversation too, okay? Um, if you have a need this morning, you want to come up here and talk with me or go to the back. Somebody from the prayer team will meet you back there. Um, we can pray with you. If you're ready to be baptized today, the water is ready. It's a little bit cool, but that's okay. It's still warm out. Um, if you're ready to, to make that public declaration that says, you know what, I, I, I belong to Jesus, um, I want to encourage you with that. All right, let's pray. God, thank you for this time together. I thank you for this group of people that you have drawn together on this date, on this time, in this place. By divine appointment, God, everybody who's here is exactly where they need to be. Help us in our fear, Lord. You are bigger than any of our fears. Help us to give our lives to you so that we can fully know what it means to go out in the power of the resurrection, knowing that though our flesh will die, we will never die. Our souls will live with you forever. Thank you, Lord, for being with us in Jesus' name. Amen.